Damn, I don't know how to design this freaking wood beam. Could somebody help me out here? I'm trying to do this remodel and I mean, this is like 30 feet long and I gotta support half of this roof. Like, how the hell do I do this? I mean, isn't there like something out there? Well, let me tell you something. Are you ready to design your own wood beam for your backyard deck or trellis or even reinforce the floor or the roof of your own house? Do you need a two by joist or a larger four by or six by sawn lumber and even engineered lumber or even a heavy duty glue lamp beam? If you don't and you wanna know how to design a wood beam you need to keep watching to find out how to design a wood beam in five simple steps designing a simple wood beam i think should be something that every aspiring diy homeowner needs to know in this video i will show you the steps to figure out what beam size you need for your next building renovation that you're planning on it could help you for your next renovation or building a deck in your backyard or if you're hiring a contractor or even helps to be a little more educated when you're hiring an engineer but how do you approach this in your next house remodel and where do you start let's find out step number one first you would want to understand what this beam is going to be supporting. The most important thing in structural engineering is called the load path. I will have a whole separate video on this subject, but it simply means that you need to follow the path that the width of the structure is going to fall down to your foundation of your building. From roof rafters to wall top plate through the wall studs into the header and then the jack studs in the header and then ultimately down to the foundation. This is by far the most important thing to pay attention to when you're modifying a load bearing structure. This is what keeps the building standing and not understanding and following the load path of a building has caused numerous collapses over time and killed many people. So that is why understanding load path and what is supporting your beam is so important. All right, back to looking at our example of demoing a wall and resupporting your roof framing with a beam. You need to find out whether the wall you're removing is a load bearing wall. You can simply do that by seeing if other floor or roof members, two by members or joists are resting on that wall. If you have that specific condition, then the wall is considered load bearing. Most likely, the reason why this wall was there in its first place is to support the roof. And sometimes that is a lot easier said than done because when you open up your roof or when you look in your crawl space or in your roof attic, there's a lot more going on there and it's difficult to understand what's really load bearing and what's not. But just think of what is really being supported by that wall and you'll get your answer. Next, step number two. Next, you need to estimate what loads you're going to need to design the wood beam. How the heck do you do that? Well, really simple actually. Look at your roof framing and if it's generally two by roof framing or joists that are lightweight jib board ceiling and OSB roof sheathing with shingles, then you're looking at about 10 pounds per square foot average weight of the roof structure. What that means is that there are about 10 pounds per square foot of area on your roof. You can also find an average weight of your roof materials if you want to estimate this more accurately by searching on Google or looking at standard construction material weights in pounds per square foot or PSF weight by given density. For example, wood weighs about 31.5 pounds per cubic foot. A single two by four weight is about one and a half by three and a half inches times 31.5 pounds per square foot divided by the conversion factor of 12 to the power two, which is 144, which gives you about 1.15 pounds per foot of length for a single two by four. Now, if you have roof joists space about two feet on center, then you divide that 1.12 pounds per foot by two feet spacing and you get an average of about 0.55 pounds per square foot for two by four framing at about two feet on center spacing for the framing itself. So the 10 pounds per square foot number is a lot more than just a two by four roof truss framing. But that number also includes many other common materials that are used on your roof, which include insulation, OSB sheathing, gypsum board, hard ceiling, etc. If you have clay tile roof or a heavier material roof, then you can increase the number by three pounds per square foot to about 13 pounds per square foot. This should be plenty for the most common residential roof structure. Now, the reason why this step is so important here is to make sure you're adding all the loads that are going to be on that beam. If you're only supporting your roof, then you only need to add that load. But if you're sizing the beam for your basement, then you need to add all of the floor loads in addition to the roof loads to make sure you account for all the weight that will be going to designing that beam. And if you're in that case, your typical floor weight is considered conservatively about 20 pounds per square foot. Now, this is absolutely the most you could probably get in a residential setting. That is why your load path is the most important because you need to follow the load from the roof structure down to the bottom of your basement. So now that we have the weight of the structure figured out, we need to find out what other loads we should design the beam for. The code requires us to also design residential roofs for 20 pounds per square foot. And in snow states, you also need to design the roofs for 30 pounds per square foot snow loads that are not 
in addition to the 20 pounds per square foot live load. Snow loads at high altitudes such as mountainous regions could be substantial and might even need to be designed for about 100 pounds per square foot or even more in some cases if you live in Lake Tahoe or the Rocky Mountains. So it's best to check with your local building jurisdiction for the actual snow load that you should be using. You can also find those snow loads requirements on your building department's website by searching the word snow load. Now, if you're designing a floor beam, you would need to design your floor beam uh, for a live load of about 40 pounds per square foot if it is an interior space or if it is an outdoor deck for 60 pounds per square foot according to the current building codes in a residential setting. Now let's look at step number three. Next step is to calculate the bending moment that you would need to be able to size your beam. Now we're getting into a little more math in getting your beam design but it is not much more than just multiplying and adding numbers so it's not that complicated. So let's say our total load for our roof example that we were looking at is about 10 pounds per square foot for the self-weight in addition to the 20 pounds per square foot standard live load which makes for a total of 30 pounds per square foot load for your beam design so now you have your load figured out it's 30 pounds per square foot next thing you need to figure out is what tributary width of roof framing the beam is supporting the way you figure this out is to measure the distance to adjacent load bearing walls and divide by two meaning half of the roof load is supported by your exterior load bearing wall and other half of the roof load is supported by the wall on the other side of your house now if you have an interior wall that you are removing then measure the distance to the adjacent walls or beams on each side of the wall you're going to be removing for example if you measure a 10 foot to the adjacent exterior wall and another 15 feet to your kitchen wall then that makes for a tributary width of 10 feet over 2 plus 15 feet over 2 which equals 12.5 feet total that means your tributary width is 12.5 feet what you do is then you multiply that 12.5 feet by the 30 pounds per square foot that we calculated previously which gives you a total of of 375 pounds per foot of length. That is it. That is the loading on the beam. It's 375 pounds per linear foot in our example. Then what you need to do is you need to calculate your moment demand by using the equation for simply supported beam which is most common and that equation is simply called WL squared over A. Here's what it means. W is your load, L is your length of your span of your beam and the others are just numbers. Let's say the beam length is 18 feet which in our case would give 375 pounds per linear foot times 18 feet squared over 8 would be a total of 15,180 pound feet of moment. Or if you multiply by 12, then you get 182,250 pound inches, which is the moment you need to design your beam for. There is other important factors to consider when you design your beam, such as shear, bearing, and etc. But the moment is generally the determining factor in the beam design for most cases where the beam length is what really matters. Now, let's figure out what size beam you actually need, which is all we want to find out, right? So we have our moment of 182,250 pound inches. What we need to do is divide that moment by 1,000 pounds per square inch or 1000 psi so what we do is we divide it by 1000 psi and what we get is 182 inches to the third right so that's pretty obvious what beam we need isn't it or it's just some weird engineering crap or what size of beam is that i mean all right all right hold on hold, hold your horses hold your horses so how we design the beam is really simple now what that number stands for is called the section modules of the beam but what what what, what does that mean it's this, this doesn't give me the beam size so what why is it so important so here's why it's so important from the section modules it's really easy to get to our beam size and find out what beam that that modulus requires so let's look at what beams gives us that section modules by looking up the section modules in the nds tables for standard two by framing members that the american wood council has published for common two by and four by wood member sizes so all that information is available for free on their website by going to the pdf link in the video description below or by searching for nds 2018 supplement in google so in this table you can find the section modulus which is designated as s sub xx for most common 2x or 4x framing members for our example combining 2 4 by 14 members will give us 102.41 times to 204.8 inches to the third which is larger than the minimum requirement we found which is 182 inches to the third now what we want to make sure here is that are the beams that we select have a bigger section modulus than the one we calculated the calculated section modulus is the absolute minimum we need to be able to make sure that that beam is adequate. 
However, you might not really like the solution here of needing two 4x14 members. I mean, who puts two 4x14 members in a beam? This would be quite big. I mean, you're talking a massive beam and for what we're trying to do. So let's look at a composite lumber member such as an LVL or a glue lamp for our solution. There is another link in the description of this video with a PDF for composite wood members that would give you much more efficient beam design and a lot more commonly used these days. Again, you can either look at the link below or you can search for TJ-9000 in Google for that PDF. On page four of that PDF, you can find the design moment for the laminated lumber. The most economical is an LSL uh, or an LVL. And most expensive would probably be a PSL, which will generally look best, especially if you're exposing it and don't want to cover it up with drywall. If you remember in our example, we calculated a required minimum design moment of 15,180 pound feet, which would give us two one and three quarter by 11 and seven eighths LSL members. The LSL solution will look a lot smaller than the two 4x14 sawn lumber solution. So let's go with that engineered lumber solution for this example. Now, please note that the width of the two one and three quarter members would total a three and a half inch member, which would fit perfectly in our two by four wall, which is actually three and a half inch thick if you're planning on covering up the beam with drywall afterwards. So we are done with our example. Or are we? In reality, there's a lot more than just sizing a beam. One of those very important things is to make sure to know how you're supporting this massive beam. Now let's look at step four. Now that we have the beam size, which actually consists of two one and three quarter by 11 and seven eighths LSL beams that are nailed together, we can look at how we're going to support it on the structure, which is one of the most important components of the structural design if you want to prevent collapse. We need to make sure the load where the beam is supported can be transferred down safely to the foundation of our house or transferred to an interior steel beam or steel column, for example, if you happen to have one. The important thing is to make sure that there are at least three or even four two by four jacks that's under the beam if the beam is up to 18 feet long and might even need to be more depending on the load of that beam span. If you don't know what jack studs are, then just Google it to find out. In some cases, you may need to add a new post altogether and a footing or a drilled caisson to provide a support for your beam. This is often done in basements of houses where you find a steel post that supports a steel beam or a heavy wood beam that carries the floor above. If you feel you have to add a steel post because you're transferring so much load down, I would recommend you call an engineer to make sure that the beam and the steel post and the new foundation you're adding is adequate. Now in our example, we're looking at a pretty simple beam design here, but that's what you find in most cases, which is relatively simple. And in many cases, people just don't know like, then they don't have a feel on what beam size that they'll need, especially if you don't have that much experience. And finally, let's look at step number five. Last step, make sure to add Simpson hangers from the new wood beam to wall jack studs or the rest of the wall framing to stabilize the structure and make sure it is stable long-term. You can find common beam to post Simpson cap CC type at your local Home Depot or on the Simpson Strong Ties website, which I'll have a link down in the description. Here are some examples of the Simpson Strong Tie hardware that is commonly used in wood construction for beams and posts. The Simpson Strong Tie website is a great resource for finding possible ways you can support beam framing to jack studs and other framing. This can be easily helpful for building wood decks or wood stairs, which we'll cover in future videos. Once you have nailed down all the Simpson strong tie hangers to your beam and supports, also make sure to add Simpson hurricane ties for, for roof rafters or trusses to the new beam we've added on our roof. This is especially important for hurricane prone areas such as coastal regions and regions with higher wind risk. That is all you really need to get your beam size for your next house renovation. If you like this video, please subscribe to Glinra TV and thanks a lot for watching.